live. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for coming to Poison Pen tonight. I'm so happy to see all of you. My name is Karen Odin. For those of you who don't know, I'm a local author. I live here in Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. I write Victorian mysteries. And the Poison Pen is my home away from home. Uh, and I am so happy today to have my friend Susan Neal with me because she is fabulous. She's here visiting from Brooklyn and um, kind of near my old stomping grounds. And uh, Susan's not going to toot her own horn, so I'm going to do it for her. She has pretty much been nominated or won uh, every award you can, the Barry, the McCavity, um, the Edgar, I know I'm forgetting one. She was an Oprah book club pick, um, New York Times bestseller. What am I forgetting? I'm a big fan of parents. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So uh, said I'm thrilled to have her here. And she's going to be talking about The King's Justice, which is number nine in the Maggie Hope series. Um, right, and, and when this book begins, it's winter of 1943. The Germans are invading Russia and getting pushed back. Maggie Hope is defusing bombs in London. But she didn't start out doing that. And for those of you who don't know Maggie Hope, she's an American, and she never had any intention of doing anything like defusing bombs. So I would like you to give us a little bit of a background on where Maggie started and how she ended up doing what she's doing now. Well, you know, she started out um, as England did. I feel like her journey is paralleling England, but you know, at the beginning of the war, everyone was so enthused and coming together and singing Roll Out the Barrel and, you know, hiding in the, the Anderson shelters. And now, um, after three brutal years of war and bombing, um, she's burned out. England is, um, like people are really tired of rationing. People are tired of feeling like they might get bombed every night. Um, it's it's hard, it's harder, and they've had to really like dig in. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell us where Maggie came from? She's an American. So She's an American. How did she get here? Um, uh, she was a mathematics major at Wellesley College, and she ended up in England because she needed to sell her grandmother's house. And then war broke out and she decided to stay and do her bit. And she ended up working for Mr. Churchill, Winston Churchill. Um, and it's actually not as far-fetched as you might think. Um, there's a memoir of one of his real life wartime secretaries. Um, the name is Elizabeth Layton Nell. And she was a Canadian um, who just sort of ended up getting a job with Winston Churchill as the war broke out. Um, and this is kind of interesting. I actually was able to correspond with Mrs. Elizabeth Snell, um, who was living in South Africa, and we exchanged actual letters, like letters on paper, not emails. <laughs> um, and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful, uh, it was such an honor to be able to speak with her, and she you know, sort of told me a little bit more about working for Churchill and what it was like, and uh, she told me that um, she, she thought my book was very nice, but um, they would never have had time for such things, like this mystery solving, <laughs> all the romance. Although, I did notice that um, she actually married a Royal Air Force pilot, so I think there must have been time for- time for some romance? <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, That's funny. It's a good story. Um, so she uh, yeah, takes a job with Mr. Churchill, and, and eventually she, works for MI5, she works in special ops, and um, eventually kind of co it comes around to being in London, and now she's doing some work, she's defusing these unexploded bombs that have landed, and, and um, they, they could explode, or they might, they, they might not, nobody really knows, it's this element of uncertainty, and I, and I, and at some point I want to come back and talk about this because I think this whole idea of the uncertainty of the bomb has a real resonance with the uncertainty of the war. Um, I think that, as you Absolutely. say, when they first started out, I, I, I think that they that England was pretty sure they were going to be able to pull it off. 
there was a lot of optimism. And now there is more uncertainty and less optimism, kind of like that. So do you, you want to say a little bit about that? Well, I think at this point in 1943, things are starting to look up a bit, um, especially with Stalingrad, um, especially with the troops amassing around Italy and in the Middle East. Um, but there's going to be no easy victory, and it's going to be long, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be brutal. And people in London, like Maggie, are, you know, kind of resigned to that. And they all have their own um, traumas and PTSD. I think that's been a big part of Maggie's story. She's been, um, she was captured by the Gestapo in Paris, and she was imprisoned on a Scottish island. And she's had all these horrible things happen to her, and this is sort of her way of processing all these things while working on these diffused, uh, <coughs> excuse me, undiffused bombs. And she's a bit of an undiffused bomb herself. She could go at any moment. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I actually want to begin by reading a bit from the very first page. It's a prologue. Um, because I think that this introduces something really interesting. It begins, the book begins, each incoming tide of the Thames brought another layer of debris, and when the waters receded, mysteries could be found buried in the silt. There was always trash, but there was also the hope of treasure. White china baby doll heads, the green spiral necks of wine glasses, small silver thimbles, points from ancient times, on the sand-covered banks, the mudlarkers patrolling the shores paused to watch German planes fly overhead. Good riddance, Martha Biddle said to her young mudlarking part partner, her 12-year-old grandson, Lewis. And the reason I wanted to read this is this line, mysteries could be found buried in the silt. The Thames really sets the stage here, I think, for the entire book. Uh, the Thames almost becomes, in the course of the book, I think, a character. It's certainly a significant part of the setting. So I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about, about your time in London, um, your time looking at the Thames, and, and how you saw the geography of London contributing to this book, and also some of your previous books, too. Well, you know, London was built on the Thames, so there's no avoiding the river, and it's such a huge part of every everyone's life in London. Um, I think it's so interesting, you know, it starts out so small and in, in the beautiful sort of innocent country, and then you know, it goes on and it eventually, you know, snakes through London and then empties out into the sea. I mean, it's a wonderful metaphor for life. Um, so the Thames part uh, in London sort of, to me, represents adult life where you're working and there's industry and things are happening and it's, uh, it's definitely part of, like, the journey, I would say. How much time did you spend in London before you started writing Maggie? Well, I was really lucky to spend actually a fair amount of time in London, and for a really crazy reason. Um, my husband is a puppeteer, and he works for Sesame Street and the Jim Henson Company. And um, we, we were there uh, because he was doing a show called Bear in the Big Blue House on Disney Channel. And so we were there for Disney Channel UK, and I went out to uh, a pub with a British friend of ours, and he said, you know, you might want to go to the war rooms because despite what you Yanks think, World War II didn't start with Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so that's how I, I, I took that as a challenge, and the very next day I went to the war rooms and, you know, completely, completely changed my life. And that was where Maggie Hope was sort of born. That was where Maggie Hope was born, and one of the reasons I think it all clicked for me, like, first of all, it was just such an incredible experience to be in the War Rooms, um, which is the bunker uh, near 10 Downing Street where Churchill and his colleagues ran the war. Um, so you're, you're walking the same hallways, you're, you're seeing the same lights, the same doors, like, it's very immersive. Um, but the other thing was that I was doing a tour and I had, like, little headphones. Mm -hmm. And um, the voice was, well, it was an actress, but it was of the, the Elizabeth Layton Nell in her memoir. So I, I heard her words as I walked around the war rooms. And I do remember stopping at the secretary's room. I know you've been there, Karen. Yeah. So, and I do remember thinking, like, these women, like, everybody's thinking about, like, the men, and everybody's thinking about Winston Churchill, and, as we should be. But 
the women probably had such amazing stories. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was how that all happened. How many people here have been to the war room? Okay. Oh, okay. And you remember how low the ceilings were? And my, so my husband and I went, and he's 6'2", mm -hmm. and he did a lot of ducking. Like, he kind of kept walking hunched over. <laughs> you know, he had to, like, duck underneath things and, you know, watch his head because it'd be something hanging. And But I remember how lightless it was. The, the, the lights were not warm. It was this kind of a grayish green sort of color to right. them. Right, and then imagine all the smoke, the oh, cigar yeah. and the cigarette oh, smoke. Yes. And mm -hmm. There was an air ventilation system, but I can't think it was... It's not like effective. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. So, yeah. no, it's a, it's a great beginning for a, for a story. Are there any other places in London that um, you either worked into your book or were just really helpful <laughs> to kind of feel what it was like to be in World War II there? You know, this doesn't actually have to do with World War II directly, but, um, you know, there's the monument to the Great Fire of London. And I remember that that's not really far from the tower, which is where a lot of this book takes place. And it, it does work into a scene sort of at the end. And it just seems so resonant to me because of London surviving the Great Fire and somebody looking at the monument during World War II and thinking, well, if we could get through it back then, then we can certainly do it now. Um, and so that, that was something I had to work in. And I think I only went there because it was close to my hotel. And I was, you know, I was just sort of like, oh, well, I should probably go. And, you know, and then I was just sort of like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. It is sort of an anchor of courage, right? Yeah, like absolutely. It, 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 it's, a, it's something that people can actually hang on to and look at and say, okay, So uh, one of the elements of the story that I thought was really interesting was the theft of the Strahd. Yes. So we're, uh, so I actually, when I was living in Milwaukee, uh, we had a friend, we, uh, we lived next door to Roger and Andy. Roger was six foot four and played bass for the Milwaukee Symphony, and Andy was five foot two and played violin. And so they always <laughs> used to say it was very size appropriate instruments. But one of their very good friends was the um, concert master. And he had a straw, and it was stolen. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Yeah, I, oh my they did get it back. They had um, because there was there wasn't a sensor on the violin itself because you couldn't do that. That would ruin the sound. But there was one on the case, and they managed to track the case to a certain point, and then. There was some, I, I mean, it was, it was crazy how they managed to track this thing down, but Frank finally did get his Strahd back. It wasn't even his Strahd. Someone had given it to him to play for the length of his lifetime. I, I know, can you imagine his guilt? Um, anyway, but Frank did get it back. But where did you get the idea for using the Strahd um, piece? Well, one of the things that I go into is um, the British Italians. So those are people born in Italy who came to Britain, to London. And also their children and relatives, um, they were called the Britallians. That was like the nickname, Britallians. And they lived in Clerkenwell in London. And I wanted to have something that tied in with Italian culture. And so the violin, the Stradivarius, the classical music, um, the artist who has the violin taken from him is uh, one of the Britallians. So that was a way to sort of dovetail a lot of some of the different themes in I also have a friend in London who's a violinist, and actually we had a wonderful conversation about this because he thinks that basically the strats are overrated, and if you went into a room with you know where you couldn't see like what or you didn't know who was playing what, that actually modern violins are much better, mm -hmm. and he had to he had a I think a two hundred thousand dollar violin and he mm -hmm. sold it to um, start his own music school so. So I, I got to have a lot of really good conversations with him, though, about violins and strats and the sort of romance and the mystery of, like, the name. Right. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's kind of mystique. Yes, yes. And um, so uh, from what I understand uh, from a friend of mine who, who does play violin, the Gesu is the other brand or yes. whatever it is. And some people think that that's better than the Strad, but the Strad does be a better job of marketing. Um, I guess <laughs> I think there there's like there are more legends. Yes, Strad. Right, and it, I don't know, it rolls off the tongue easier. Yeah. Stradivarius. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so you alluded to um, 
our heroine being um, traumatized and having what we would now call PTSD. Uh, that, that phrase didn't really exist back then, but they were trying no. to figure out what exactly it was. Shell shock was Shell one, shock of, the, was one of the terms one. from World right. War One, right, exactly. Um, but there, interestingly, there's another character, and I'm not going to do any big spoilers here, but there's another character who could also be considered to have been traumatized. And where does your, I, I think it's very interesting that you had these two characters playing off each other. Where does your interest in trauma come from? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I have to say in terms of war trauma, um, my godfather um, served in Vietnam and I always knew him as such a happy, um, silly, goofy guy. And he would just make the best jokes and he was just always so, um, you know, full of life. And <laughs> then he got on Facebook and um, he, I should not say this, well, I don't know, he won't watch it. <laughs> um, he, he will uh, drunk Facebook um, on Veterans Day on the 4th of July, and he has um, made contact with a lot of other guys who he served with. They were like 17, I mean, you know, so. Um, anyway, he's been so um, vulnerable and open, and then I felt like I could really talk to him about the war and, his experiences and his memories and like how he sort of keeps it together and um, it was it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to learn and also a wonderful opportunity to get him to get to know him as like a full human being not just the fun goofy part right yeah because there's a whole lot of pain and trauma and PTSD too Now everybody's sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, like, let's talk about something funny. Um, so uh, here's, here's a fun question that was actually um, posed by someone who was a friend of mine. If Maggie Hope were alive today, <coughs> what would she be doing? Where would she be working? That's a really good question. Um, so I was thinking, you know, she would she would maybe go from Wellesley to MIT and be able to do a graduate degree in, a, in math or science. Um, the thing is, I actually have a number of female friends who went on to do graduate work at MIT, but you know, in the sciences and the STEM su subjects. And um, it's still really hard. It's still really sexist. They're still really outnumbered, and they're not necessarily treated well. So I've had a lot of friends who went to graduate school, you know, who are my peers, um, who've dropped out. So I don't know what, I mean, would Maggie have stayed the course? Maybe. I wonder if um, if she had experienced 9-11, I wonder what that would have, um, how that would have influenced her and if she would have then sort of done a similar move into intelligence and um, spying is so different now. But um, I thought maybe like with computer science that would be something that she could, mm -hmm. she would do. Yeah. I, I Definitely, I know what you're saying with respect to the the, whole, the gender divide. My daughter is in <coughs> college; she's a sophomore, and I remember she's in she's in Chicago, and I remember her calling me, I guess maybe two or three weeks into her first semester, and saying, "Mom, there's 19 kids in my computer science section. I am the only girl at Northwestern," and. There is one tenured woman professor in the computer science department. The and it just seemed, it just seemed yeah. outrageous. <laughs> I know, to yeah. the, in 2020. I, it's 2020. <laughs> but Karen, tell them what your daughter's doing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Susan and I got I'm, to chit chat before we went out to dinner. I'm so impressed. And I'm, I'm so, like a fan. So, yes, my daughter, I, well, I shouldn't put this on Facebook. She's going to see this. I'm not supposed to announce this I'm yet. Sorry. <laughs> But she just found out that she got a internship at NASA for the summer. Oh, so yes, yeah, she's doing computer science and design, and we are so excited for her. She's in ninth grade. I remember she got the NASA app on her phone, and she'd come out in the mornings and give us updates on what, what was happening with NASA. <laughs> where was you know whatever was Artemis or whatever was flying around the moon? She would she would do that and. So, but so I am maybe I'm Maggie so maybe be doing something like that. I she hope would be so. kind of like your daughter. I hope so. I hope she would. Yeah, I hope she would be sort of like Julia. So, um, 
So let's talk a little bit about the romance, because I'm, I'm a big romance girl. There is romance in all of my books, because I like romance. <laughs> and uh, you've got, she, Maggie has had a series, a few boyfriends. Uh, she has. Nothing's really worked out all that well. No. Um, can you tell us why, and do you see her... Um, is some of it, you know, her trauma and also the war itself keeping the romance from actually flowering, developing, succeeding? Um, talk to us a little bit about the boys. Well, you know, Maggie didn't grow up seeing a uh, happy, you know, seeing her mother and father together. So there's really no like imprint for her to follow. Um, and I think she also, Although she was so smart and she was so encouraged in academics, I think there was a social and emotional part of her that was kind of neglected. And that's how what we see that, you know, she's all there in terms of how brilliant she is. But I think through the books, we see her really sort of start to develop more of a emotional intelligence. Um, and then if you couple that with, you know, boys and then the stress of war and the stress of travel and the stress of <laughs> bombs and death and you know all those things like you know it's not really conducive to wedding bells <laughs> <laughs> also that's not really conducive to a good book <laughs> you know, it's true because you know as soon as the romance is there and solid you know once you've got that you're like uh there's, there's a plot line that is finished, and it, it yeah, it's kind of... And would her husband expect her to stay at home? Would she, exactly. you know, have a baby? Would she stay home with the baby? You know, there's yeah, all these kinds all of things. All of a sudden, like, she can't yeah. be running around on a motorcycle and, you know, staying out until four in the morning and diffusing bombs. Like, you don't do that. So yeah. I think to some extent, you know, these, keeping these boys at bay is part of what is, you know, keeping well, I think for, oh, the book going. In, so... Uh, Detective Jurgen is the love yeah, interest. Yeah, I like him. I know. You know what? A lot of people do. I mean, I, I do too. But you know, <laughs> a lot of people are really kind of rooting for him. I think you know, Maggie is so kind of traumatized. I think she became a bit too needy, and um, I think he kind of got a little cold feet. Like, I think he kind of withdrew a bit. So maybe when she comes back to London, she won't be quite in that same mental place and they can right. have a better rapport. Well, you, you just alluded to something that you, you know, pop in at the end of the book, which is that she is leaving London. You want to tell, tell us where she's going? Well, the next book is called uh, The Hollywood Spy. Oh. So, yeah. So Maggie's going to be going to the U.S., to Los Angeles, and she is going to be helping her ex-boyfriend, John Sterling, with uh, a murder, a solving a, a murder case, and um, Sarah Sanderson, the ballerina, she's gonna be in a film in Los Angeles. So we're gonna have like three of the old crew over on the West Coast. So I'm really yeah. excited, yeah. Yeah, and I, one of the things that I really appreciate about your books is the secondary characters do not exist merely to be friends or foes of your protagonist. They have a real life. They do things outside the book. They, are, they're not just sort of, you know, uh, just sidekicks. They're, they're not sidekicks, and they're not they their own books. Yeah, really. So, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about the ballerina because I know that you have a history of writing about the ballet. Yeah, it's funny. This came up at dinner. Y'all should have been at dinner with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I didn't want to share the pizza. <laughs> Um, so I, I was actually able to work uh, as a freelancer for New York City Ballet, and so I was there a lot, I saw a lot, I was friends with some of the dancers, and I'm still friends with some of the dancers, so I kind of got an inside look at ballet at that level, and um, Sarah's such an interesting character to me because um, she was never planned. I had all sorts of characters planned out, and I had all sorts of things outlined, and she just sort of showed up. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Yeah, it's like the best feeling. I mean, it's also really annoying because you you, you have all your plants. But she just kind of showed up in the first book, and she's she's never really left. So I adore Sarah. And um, yeah, and I think it's interesting. She's sort of doing. She's an artist, and she's continuing her career, and she's also doing stuff for the war effort. So yeah. How do you see her as a sort of foil for Maggie? Well, Sarah's much more um, 
tuned in with her emotions and she's much more wise about love and life than Maggie is. Um, she doesn't have uh, the same sort of intellectual passions that Maggie does. I mean, her, her art is really physical um, and I don't know. I think they're really good together though. I think they really complement each other. And I think that secondary characters often, um, they help illuminate some aspect of the primary character, oftentimes by showing us what they aren't or what they don't have. Right. Um, I was doing a talk a few weeks ago. Love this dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was doing a talk a few weeks ago. I was in Philadelphia, and I was talking with elementary school kids about books and different aspects of books and story, and. One of the things that came up with the older children, we were, we were using Harry Potter as a sort of central text just because most people were at least familiar with the movies. And we were talking about uh, Hermione and Ron with respect to Harry. And we're talking about, well, why can't Harry just go it alone? And they said, well, because Hermione is sort of the clever, bookish, smart one, maybe not quite as instinctive. And what does Ron have that Harry doesn't? He has family. Like droves of family, right? Like, like I, I, so I don't know much family. Like twelve yeah. Weasleys or something like that. <laughs> and and it's that, that it, there's that marvelous moment that um, I I happen to remember from the movie because it's so striking uh, when Harry walks into the Weasleys' house for the first time and sees the clock with all the different people on it and all of the all of the Weasleys are at breakfast and Mr. Weasley wants to know what is the significance of a rubber duck. And, and Harry, for the first time, understands what it is to be surrounded by that and what Ron grew up with. So I think sometimes these secondary characters, you know, whether they start out that way or not, they appear because they illuminate something that Maggie, um, Maggie lacks or that she's gonna grow toward. So what other secondary character um, is you know, one of your favorites? I love Chuck. I think she's, so Charlotte is her real name, but we all know her as Chuck, and she's sort of, you know, all of my characters are, um, you know, combinations of like two or three or four people. I'm sure, do you do this too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, you know, Chuck is based on like two of my absolute favorite people in the whole world, so um, I, I just love writing her, and she didn't have an easy time in this book, but, you know, she's she's a tough cookie, and she'll, she'll make it just fine. So one of the keys to solving the murders in the King's Justice lies with a murderer of another book, what's called a sequential killer. They didn't call them serial killers, it was sequential killer. Serial murderers, they would call it sequential yeah. killers. Um, at this time, Maggie has to work with this person in a way which gets her thinking about what makes a predatory killer. Now Maggie is herself willing to kill, and she has killed, which has very strong views on predators, cruelty, and evil if we want to give it that word. And yet, I have a feeling she doesn't end up in the same place as she starts the book when it comes to this particular killer. You want to say a little bit about that? Well, again, when Maggie started out, she had a very black and white views of the world and of good and evil. And through spending time with this man, um, I don't think she's forgiven him or absolved him, but perhaps has come to more of an understanding of how this could possibly have happened. Um, she did a lot of research and she sort of looked at nurture and nature and genetics and all of these different things and there's really no answer. But um, she's also had to take a look at herself and you know, her own mother was a Nazi. So she had to sort of look at her own background and think there but for the grace of God go I. Um, and I think that was an interesting place for her to be. And I think one of the things, and there are a couple other of your books that have done this as well, where something seems to be a particular way, and then you get a little more context, and it shifts the way that we see things. You just, just a little bit more backstory that provides understanding of a character, and maybe even invites compassion from us, where you know, at the beginning, at the outset, you might not feel that way so much. Right, and even in the book where he was, you know, the, the last book where he was, like, you wouldn't necessarily feel all that much compassion. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but that was interesting, and that was just something that, I, it, it wasn't like I had an agenda or anything, I just sort of, like, working with the character and sort of spending time with him and 
thinking about him and his time in prison and what he might be reflecting on, um, that was just sort of the way the story turned. So when you start your books, do you know where they end? Sometimes. Uh, although I'm really good at making outlines and then tossing them out the window. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but I like having the outline. I feel very safe with the outline. And then when I go off, you know, off, like off the trail, it's like, it's okay because I know where it could have gone, so. How do you do it? How do you do it when you write? I usually begin with one or two chapters that feel really solid. Like I have the, and, and in fact, they it almost feels like um, a movie. Sometimes the scene appears, and I'm just writing it down. Transcribing. Because, yeah, it's, yeah. Yes, transcribing. That's the word. That, that's exactly it. And um, for example, in my in this next book that I'm writing, uh, I had done a bunch of research about two years ago on the ivory trade in Africa mm -hmm. um, in the 1870s and Henry Morton Stanley's adventure into Africa. And it's dark and sort of harrowing. And I, those stories clung to me. Um, I, think, I think I read the book about it. It was King Leopold's Ghost and, it, I, and I, read it is, I read it maybe four years ago. And it still sticks with me. But um, the opening scene was Gwendolyn. She's at this party, Lady Bainbridge's party. Uh, she, Lady Bainbridge is hosting Henry Morton Stanley, who was basically, after his first trip to Africa, he did a goodwill tour where he's trying to get money together and support so he could go back to Africa and find the beginning of the Nile. That was his big quest. And he, um, so he's, and he, he, when he showed up from Africa, he had photographs and they had the magic lantern. Oh, Do you remember? Wow. Yeah, they had a magic lantern that they could project them up on the wall so people could actually see, for example, the Sultan of Zanzibar or the, the, these huge leafy trees that you know, no one in, in England had ever seen before, that kind of thing. Anyway, this scene appeared in my head and, and, and I wrote it. So I get, and, and I, know, I know kind of where it's going. Um, her, Gwendolyn's best friend, Kate, her husband just got back from the trip with Henry Morton Stanley and He's a journalist, and he is going to write a story that is uh, dark and that reveals some of the horrifying elements of the ivory and the slave trade that were going on. And Henry Morton Stanley doesn't want that to come out, of course, because he's not going to make any. He's not going to be able to get money to go back because you know. I mean, slavery. When was the slavery was outlawed? I think in Britain by like the 1820s. Yeah, they were early. They were before America was. And uh, anyway, so this, this whole scene appeared full blown. I, I can see the people, I've got the chandeliers, I've got Henry Morton Stanley up front with this funny white hat on, and I could write that whole entire thing and I have a beginning sense. And then after that, I have no clue where I'm going. Well, do you know, who here knows um, Charles Finch? Who reads Charles Finch? Okay, you should all be reading Charles Finch because he's amazing. Um, but I was doing an event with him in Washington DC last night and we were talking about, he brought up this amazing image of how, like, if you're driving, like, on a mountain road at night, and your, your headlights, you, you know, you, you can see, like, you know, maybe four feet in front of you, and you just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how you get there. You just sort of keep going. You can only see sort of four feet ahead, but he said it much more eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> he was here, I think, two weeks ago, maybe? Yes. Yeah. So and, and I got to I got to ask him some questions. He, he, he admitted that in his teenage years he read a lot of Wodehouse, which I was just like, oh, now I completely understand you. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so in this book, uh, you know, we we've, we were talking a little bit at, at dinner about. Um, is it Gillian? Is, I mean, is it Gillian Flynn? It's Gillian, okay. actually. Yeah. Um, and she how she writes these books with uh, heroines. Who aren't particularly attractive or likable? No, they're not they're not. unreliable. You know, they're drinkers. They're <laughs> they drink, they smoke, they smoke, and they're they're kind of sullen sometimes, and and um and and moody. Um, it when I remember reading the first Maggie Hope and feeling like Maggie was just a very warm, attractive, slightly innocent, a little bit naive. I kind of wanted to be her big sister. Um, this book shows a different side of Maggie. Now we, you know, she's gone through trauma. She's gone through the war. She's, um, I think, you know, lost some of her hope, as it were. Um, but what do you think? I, I, how do you feel about showing this darker side of her? 
I think it's appropriate for everything that she's been through. I think it's appropriate for her age. I think when she was 23 and just starting out, um, her naivete um, was also appropriate. Although she, I don't know, like, she had an edge. I've had people come up to me and say, like, you know, Maggie's not really likable. I'm just, well, sometimes, you know, <laughs> what can I say? But, um, yeah, I, I think um, given everything she's been through and that she's, you know, coming up on 30, that she's she's in a place where she's much more um, able to see grays instead of blacks and whites. No, and I, I really appreciate that. I like I like the the more complicated, more nuanced um, pictures of the war or whatever. So so here's a more general question for you. What attracts you to mystery? Oh. <laughs> You know, with mystery, there's always a place to start. You know, you, there's there's like the body, and then you kind of go from there. And I think, you know, especially in wartime, it, it's been really interesting for me to, you know, think about war, the big picture of war, but also think about how the home front was not this united, um, you know, happy, raw, raw place. And there was actually quite a lot of crime on the home front, and, you know, people were not necessarily united. I guess I really like seeing... Um, World War II, which is often portrayed as very black and white, and just seeing it as like a lot more complicated. And you think mystery somehow lets you? Yeah, do absolutely. That? Because then you can see, you can investigate crime, you can investigate murder, you can investigate all kinds of dark people and dark impulses and what that was really like. I remember, I guess it was maybe six months ago. I can't remember what event I was at here, but someone commented that World War II is really the last war where we had a definite villain. Oh. And yeah. I thought it was an interesting point. Um, I, obviously, Hitler is, is, our, is our villain. I mean, there's kind of, it, 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 you, you can kind of sketch it in black and white terms, in a way, Well, yeah, the, they're the white hats, the black yeah, hats, yeah. you know. But what, what do you, how, how do you see that kind of maybe messiness that you're talking about um, as being maybe reflective of what's going on in our world today? Well, I think with World War II at least, you know, um, if you look far more closely at the Allied side, you know, there are all kinds of moral questions. There's mm -hmm. the use of atomic weapons. There's the use of um, something I touched on um, sending in spies to deliberately be captured and tortured to give this information. And that was a real thing. Um, I like to keep my history to history. I don't really, um, it's funny, because like sometimes people will read my books and they will see current events, and I'm just sort of like, no, I actually just told my story. So um, I think, I mean, of course, there's always like gray areas and the more you learn about people, the more you learn that there are different perspectives and different sides. Um, and I think themes from then and themes themes from now. I mean, there's you know, obviously there's going to be crossover just because we're all human and we're all trying to figure things out. And I you know, somebody said that there seem to be more and more mysteries these days. And I do wonder if some of it is because a lot of us are in the position of trying to figure things out um, and, and the questions are almost often seeming insoluble and um, a mystery is deeply satisfying because usually you get a conclusion. You get right, you get order a, versus chaos. Yes, yeah, so you've got all this chaos and then you can bring some order to it and that's very satisfying. I think too as a woman, um, you know, we are more vulnerable, uh, there is more crime against women and it is a way for me at least symbolically to kind of fight back against that and to see a female take on the role of solving these crimes or solving whatever it is going on in the particular book and that feels really good to me so you know like when we we think about Jack the Ripper and things like that we don't really think about the females we don't think about the victims and I I like I like to think about the victims and like giving them their due. Yeah, and giving them some voice and giving yeah. them some autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, um, a panel that I was on uh, at a mystery conference where all four of the women 
on the panel were writing about women heroines, um, protagonists, who uh, were finding some wiggle room and some autonomy for themselves in very patriarchal societies. Now I know that I write in the 1870s and that was still a time when women couldn't even own property and they were considered the property of their husbands and their children were considered the property of their husbands. Uh, 1943, we've moved, a, we've moved forward a little, the women of the boat. Yes. Uh, you're allowed to earn money and keep it. So Maggie, Maggie has some, Maggie has some, uh, she's allowed to go to Wellesley and get a degree and do something she with it. She owns property. She owns property. Um, and she's allowed to, allowed to ride around on a motorcycle and smoke cigarettes and you know, all kinds of things. Uh, but I think that sometimes in the, it, one of the things that we concluded after we were looking uh, at these stories that were everything from sort of like 13th century, 14th century all the way up to the Gilded Age in New York, we were talking about how a lot of these are satisfying partly because we find some wiggle room for the women. Yes, absolutely. And you've got a lot of wiggle room for, for Maggie. Yes. So what ways do you see, though, that she's still constrained, do you think? Ooh. Um, well, this is something I'm going to touch upon in the next book, and I think this is the way all women are constrained. She's coming up, she's, I think, 27 or 28 in this book. And especially in 1943, I mean, that was quite old. She's a spinster. She's a spinster. Mm -hmm. So she's actually really thinking about that and what that means. And does she want that? Does she want a husband? Does she not want a husband? Does she want to have a family? Does she not want to have a family? And there's the whole ticking clock. And I think that's just a biological reality that we all deal with. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, so how else is she constrained? Uh, well, she has sort of created more space for herself. Um, and she sort of learned how to manage men in a way um, and sort of own her power. And I think we're going to see more of that coming up where she's sort of like, you want me to go in and be your agent? Well, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to run this. This is why, because I have more experience and I know more about this. And well, one of the earliest scenes in the book is she is teaching a man how to defuse the bomb. Yeah, although he, he's quite young, but yes, yeah. but but still, I mean, there's there's definitely a gender flip going yeah. on there that I think is really interesting. I loved him. Yeah, I, I liked him too. Really he was sweet. Guy. Yeah, <laughs> not like a boyfriend, but just like a really nice yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, nice guy. Um, so here's some. Um, we have time for maybe one more question, then we'll go to the audience. Sure. Um, in the first book, Mr. Churchill's secretary, Maggie gives this wonderful idealistic speech about why England must fight. It's stirring, but she sounds young, even naive, in light of what happens in the later books. In King's Justice, the killer she's working with says, you've changed. Your soul is darker now. By the end of this war, it will be black as pitch. Do you see her going darker? Is she going to come back to the light at any point? Do you well, feel like it? Re remember her last name is Hope. Yes. So we always have that. But I do think there's there are still years of war left. And I think Maggie will um, realize that sometimes to win the war, you have to compromise. And that's something that in earlier books, she was not willing or able to do. And I think as she's getting older and she's seeing the toll the war is taking on people, that she's starting to understand that perspective too. So I think she's gonna have a definite um, like come to God moment about that. And it's, it's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be pretty. Sorry. <laughs> so sorry. If, you know, if I had my way, I really would have them all like drinking tea and talking about thoughts and, you know, like just having fun, going to the ballet. But that wouldn't really sell any books. <laughs> yeah, I'm in trouble to sell books. Um, and then the other, oh, actually, the other, one other thing that I wanted to, to bring up was, um, and this is something that I found myself remembering uh, Foyle's War. There was an episode with a conscientious objector. And we have some of that in this book. It's touched on. So do you want to say a little bit about um, how you do the research for that, uh, for that piece of it? Because that's a, it's a, a 
complicated, um, it's a complicated, really complicated, historically yeah. complicated thing, especially, it's different now to look back on it than it was in the Oh, war. I'm sure at the time it was just so awful and so it, it was, took such strength to be a conscientious objector. Um, you know, there were a lot of people, there were so many different reasons people were conscientious objectors. Um, they were Quakers, there were Jehovah's Witnesses, they were, um, there was a man who was black who did not want to leave his farm. He thought his farm would be taken if he went into the military, and so he stayed and he defused bombs. Um, you know, all kinds of crazy reasons. And I think, you know, to me, defusing bombs is just as scary as going into battle. I mean, I don't know that it's that much easier. Or, but yeah, but they were so, they were so, um, you know, disrespected and looked down upon, and there was sort of a resurrection of the white feather, the giving the white feather to show cowardice. Um, I don't know, I think the men who did that were extremely strong, and certainly very brave too. Um, well, we're gonna we're gonna um, put a pause on it and say goodbye to our Facebook audience. Thank you so much for being with us, Thank and you. Um, and we'll ask some we'll have some questions from the audience.